Um, I am Paul Grant. I'm Daniela Lero. We're the attorneys here in the office. We have one more to introduce, right? That's right. As of today. Yeah. They have come up in the Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now I'll turn around. There you go. There you go. Also with us is, is Debbie Mike Croft. She is um, a part of our firm. And then uh, Debbie is unique because uh, she and I have been on a journey together where her mom did the estate planning and um, unfortunately we lost her but Debbie has the experience of going through the planning, going through the settlement process and then has some experience in what it means to do exactly what we're going to be talking about today which is maximizing your inheritance and, um, and having a trust share. Um, it'll be no more than a two hour program with a smaller in-house crowd. It usually speeds up, but we actually really do want you to ask questions. So stop us at any point in time, ask questions, um, not just questions, but uh, Debbie will also be giving insights and, and uh, thoughts about her experience as a beneficiary as well. Um, we gave you some paper to take notes on. So uh, there, we have a couple handouts that we'll give you throughout the time as well. Those are great to be added into your white binder uh, to keep for future reference. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about some of the limiting assumptions that more of a traditional law firm has. Um, and so we here believe that there's a relation, that relationship is a really important part of what we do. Um, a more traditional law firm says, here's your documents and come back when you need when you need help. And then the helpers or the beneficiaries, um, they never get to meet the attorney. Um, and there's just, they have a negative um, uh, relationship with the firm that created the plan. And they're very, it's a very disjointed um, because they're oftentimes not invited into that conversation. Um, and so there's assumptions that the creators of the trust wanted to control them, um, or that they don't get to discuss what the beneficiaries want. So there's just a disconnect between the creators and the beneficiaries. And then when the creators want, or excuse me, when the beneficiaries want to have open and honest discussions with the creators of the trust, oftentimes from the beneficiary's point of view, it feels like they may be greedy, like let's talk about your money. Um, let, let's talk about what happens and how much I'm getting and how I'm going to be able to use it, which in my experience is the furthest from the truth um, of, of how beneficiaries are approaching and wanting the conversation. So a part of our goal here is that we want to help bridge those gaps. Also, we want to encourage you to make sure that you've done your planning properly. Um, also, for, uh, for my clients in the room, this helps us assess whether or not um, people are ready in your family or whether further family discussions have to be uh, had. And we also just want everyone to increase the comfort level with what, we are, what, what needs to happen during this process, both during our lifetime at passing and then also after wealth transfer occurs. So, um, thoughts, uh, besides being uh, drug into a meeting, uh, did anyone come here today with specific expectations or hopes of understanding or getting something out of today's program that you would want to share with us? So, thoughts? I'm just very curious how it works, especially since, you know, my uh, beneficiaries, the primary ones, are really young. Yeah. Um, 
I'd like to just kind of know, like, hey, what are they looking forward to, which, you know, I wouldn't know, because I won't be here when this happens. Yes, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I get them into? <laughs> right. So share with us. Uh, we do, and specifically if you're watching the video as well, we want to know what you think of the program. So please take the time, shoot us a quick email, uh, give us some feedback on what we're doing well, what we can do to improve. Our goal is not to waste time. Our goal is to really create educational processes that assist families with everything that we're trying to do for them. So let us know what's working and what's not. So um, Danielle will give us some of the background of, well, how did we get to this point in having a discussion about how do we transfer wealth and prepare families to receive it better? Uh, so it's our experience that most estate plans don't work. Um, so this is a discussion that we have with the creators as they're coming into our process. Um, and so for beneficiaries in the room anyways, why would you say that that is true? Can you give some ideas? All the assets are scattered around. All the assets are scattered around. You might not know where they are. That's true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other ideas? Most of the time, the uh, whatever the plan is, you've never been made privy to it, so mm -hmm. you have no idea what it is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, you don't know where the assets are, you don't know what the plan says. So there's a lot of reasons. There's also legal and tax changes from our end that um, most people aren't keeping track of. So uh, here we want to make sure that, so stage one is to make sure that the creators can have um, absolute control while they're alive and well. Everyone who sits across from me in these counseling sessions, they want to maintain control. So stage two is making sure that a time of disability, which is that for one reason or another, you can't control your finances, um, that we plan for them and their loved ones. And then, and then today, what we're really talking about is stage three, getting what, what they have to, when they want to and the way they want to, so giving their stuff the way they, they want to. And then also, there's more that we can do as a firm, um, and then just uh, some self-confession here is that as I built this firm, I've been very focused on just trying to get things moving forward, right? And as we continue to bring on more, um, uh, more employees, our ability to branch out and look at other programs likewise expands. So a lot of our heart is not just a bank account, but how do we ensure that the essence of who we are is likewise transferred? So we can call those things such as um, uh, uh, memories or historical issues or value transfers and not just a bank account. Actually, getting a bank account from one person to another is the easiest thing we do. Uh, but um, we have a limited time on this earth and so actually also transferring who we are not just what we have is also a part of what estate planning can be and so we're not there yet but that is the direction we want to move and offer other opportunities for that as well uh, so now we're at stage three that somebody has passed away so what does it mean to actually have wealth reception because estate planning specifically in a traditional sense when it's very document orientated is only from the view of the creator so we ask a lot about kids so I know a lot about my clients children uh, with their strengths their weaknesses their tendencies because we ask it's all from kind of a hierarchical position which is the creator's view um, but now the process is changing because the creators are no longer here with us. Now we have turned our attention to the receivers. So our promise is to our clients is number one, we will take care of you first. During your lifetime, we will ensure that you have documents and that we will be watching over you as attorneys to ensure your safety through your lifetime. And after you are gone, then we will turn our attention towards your family to ensure that they are well protected. Okay, So it always starts with the creator, but most estate planning, admittedly, 
is a very top-down approach. It's, this is my money, and I'm going to do this with it. Um, and so, but that leaves a lot of the people who are receiving what we're trying to pass out of the equation. Uh, so we want to make sure that there's a formal dis um, process so that the creators um, can get their wealth to them in, and then pass down that wisdom as well, like we've just been talking about. Um, and we want to make sure it's fully realized, efficiently transferred, and effectively received. So we'll talk about each one of those. So fully realized means that all the creators come in and they have a vision of what, um, at the end of their life, what things are going to look like and how things are going to be passed. Um, so making sure that that creator's vision actually comes to fruition um, and knowing that they've protected the ones that they love. So efficiently transferred then is learn how to follow a proactive lifetime steps. steps. Notice we have a maintenance program to where we don't just give a document and divorce ourselves from clients. We encourage clients to be, to be um, in the maintenance program so we can make fine-tuned adjustments because life continues to have adjustments along the way. Um, in addition, the helpers and receivers, so helpers are those that um, have a role to play. If, if I became disabled, someone needs to make financial decisions for me. That's a helper. But the receivers are, if my wife and I die, my girls are to receive what we have um, built up to pass to the next generation. So their participation in these programs is equally as important to ensure that the whole family is ready instead of just a document sitting and waiting for somebody to pass away or become incapacitated. Every client has said one thing to us. Every client wants to ensure that there is a smooth transition. Okay? So, now we have different pictures of what that means, but I have yet to really meet somebody who says, you know what my goal is? To leave just a stinking mess behind so that my kids, like, start fighting and start throwing up their hands and have no idea. My whole goal is to break up the family when I die. No, it's actually 100% the opposite, which is we want to ensure with good planning and participation that everything can be efficiently and smoothly transferred uh, to the next generation. So, some of the proactive steps. So, making sure that your trust is, the trust is fully funded. Um, so, we get on our soapbox every time, so here we go again. Fully funded means that everything is either titled in the name of your trust or that um, the beneficiaries are pointing to the trust. There's two assets that we leave outside of the trust. Can anyone tell me what those are? Cars. Your car. Cars. Cars, yep. And the other one is IRAs, so your retirement account, uh, retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, but we make sure that the beneficiaries are pointing to the trust. So making sure that that's done, um, that makes sure that the plan will not go to probate. And again, that smooth transition is what we're looking for. And communicate what to do steps. Now, in other words, what to do if I were to become incapacitated or if I were to pass away. So sharing your plan and, and, and ensuring your family knows that there is a firm that has actually stayed connected to you is an important part of this um, step. And then at the back of the red binder, or actually it was transferred to your white binder, there is a locations list. Um, and that is a place where you can uh, designate where certain locations are in your home and then check off different important documents and where those are located. So for example, where do you keep your car title? Okay, so, but that's what the location list is for, is there's a place where you can actually check my car title is in blank space. What we don't want is the cartoon, which is when somebody passes away and all of a sudden the attorney goes, we need the car title, that we're doing one of the cartoon paper flips where everything is just floating up in the air trying to find the car title. So communication is key. And then keeping us um, informed of all of your helpers and your beneficiaries contact information is really helpful to make sure that the people who need to be contacted are able to be contacted as soon as something happens. Um, and then again in your white binder there is a final instructions 
Um, so you can fill those out of what you would want to happen, uh, whether it be a funeral, cremated, those types of things. Nobody cares if your favorite song is La Bamba or Amazing Grace. They would just like to know. What we're doing here today is part of that last step of proactive family involvement, which is we have many different programs. We had one back in September, which is successor trustee training, which is what happens when somebody dies, what are the steps that we have to follow. As a matter of fact, that's up at our website. And so training videos are available. If you missed that session, uh, it's available now in our video educational session, as this one will be as well. Um, we don't have grieving training. Again, this is a part of the, gr the, the expansion, but I left it in here because that'll be a part of what we continue to increase and create an environment for families instead of just creating documents. And then wealth reception is what we're doing here, is training and making sure that we're all ready and we understand exactly what, we, what happens with this trust thing after somebody passes away. All right, so. So um, after someone passes away, the first thing is to call the law firm so that we can start walking the family through what that process looks like. Um, the transfer process navigator, that's something that we talked about in the, at the end of September. So we have a whole process like Paul was saying on settlement training and what does that look like. Um, and now we're at effectively received the last three. So we covered fully realized that's from the creator's perspective. Efficiently transferred is what happens before somebody dies to get the family on the same page. And then effectively received is really what this is about today. Now from this point forward about what does it mean to effectively receive an inheritance in a trust mechanism, okay? Um, so secure appropriate assistance is the bottom step. So the three step strategy then is what our maintenance program is really built on. It starts with developing your plan. That's the creator's view. Commit yourself and your family to continuing education. So we talked about that. And then step three is now we need to secure the appropriate assistance to ensure that everything actually happens smoothly when someone passes away. So Danielle, what, what's a revocable living trust? Well, it's this candy bowl. We uh, like candy we around like candy. here. <laughs> um, so just a brief discussion of what a trust is. A trust is basically, the, it's like this holding container. So the creators have made instructions on how things would go, um, and that creates this holding container. Then we put the trust maker or trust maker's hands underneath. And um, we, all of this is your candy in life, so your bank accounts, um, your investment accounts, everything, we title into the name of the trust. So if this was my bank account, it would no longer be in the name of Danielle Olero, but now it's in the Danielle Olero Trust. So we put everything in here, put the hands underneath so that they have full and absolute control over everything that's inside of here. Um, they can spend it, use it, um, but if they became disabled, now someone else can come alongside them and either help them manage what's in here let me help you. All right, help me. Or take full control of it so that they can help the other person to, the unwell person, um, manage them and to help take care of me. So Paul but, would help take care of me. But my role, and this is uh, kind of our past um, uh, discussions, which is now my role, because she is still alive, this is her trust, is to utilize what's in her trust for her benefit, but follow the rules. All of the, the bull represents the trust itself and what has been laid out. So now I have more clear instructions on what Danielle wants as far as guidance to me to use her money appropriately. So it gives me greater security in knowing exactly what she has desired. And she mentioned something, but I kind of slipped in and took her trust from her, <laughs> which is that um, what we are noticing is that as clients age, there may be an appropriate time to when we both assist each other. This is called a co-trusteeship. So, um, so if Danielle was older than me, hi mom, <laughs> then, um, and she felt comfortable to say, I would like someone else to also help me manage this. We could hold it together like this. And now I'm able to assist uh, parents or the trust creator 
during their lifetime. And the nice thing is, is that if she ever needed to take her hand off, my hand was already there and we don't have to go through the trustee change at the time that someone is now quote unquote disabled. Okay, so a lot of times we can proactively, again, proactive, proactive, proactively bring in trustees and create almost a partnership, but the only person who can benefit from it at that point, there can be other people if the creator told us, but is the trust maker. Everything is about them during their lifetime, okay? So questions about, this, about a trust and what does it do in the concept of a trust? Um, Go ahead. I had the one about the co-trusteeship you just mentioned. So is that one that they have to come and do like legal paperwork to do it? Okay, it's not kind of informal. It's very formal and legalized and special paperwork. Yes. So it means, um, and from that point forward, if that were the case to where we were um, joint trustee, so it's her trust to stay in line with the story that, that she started with. She wants me to assist her in the finances. Even during, the pro, even during any updates that we have, so now you wanted to change, or she wanted, let's see, Danielle wanted to change um, something in her trust. But because I am a co-trustee, now it's going to take both of our signatures. Okay. okay, so it does create that there is a true partnership in that decision-making process. In, so, but Danielle has full control. She can do anything she wants, but it just means that I need to be actively participating with her. I cannot usurp her. Now I am just a partner in that with her. Okay, so very similar to married couples anyway. So. Um, so my wife and I, anytime we make a change in our own trust, it takes both of our signatures, correct? So that, that's all it requires is that now it takes both of our signatures to, um, to change something within the trust uh, spectrum. Uh, would this yes, person please. also have um, uh, their name on the trust account in the bank and they can write a check? Yes, that's exactly, and, and that's why people do it, is that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it, it's really not for today, but, but just very briefly, if I was just operating to help Danielle as a power of attorney, what the power of attorney does is just give me access to her accounts, okay? It's a spending authority. But with the trust mechanism, if we're both going to hold it, now I have a fiduciary duty. And so it raises her comfort level and her protection that I'm going to act right. And so yes, by bringing somebody else on, it means that I that we would need to go back to the bank and say Paul is now a part of my trust. So I have access, I can write the checks, I can do everything else. But there's a greater protection to the creator when we do utilize a trust format instead of a will and a uh, power of attorney format, okay? And it sits in that smooth transition, so um, there's a greater comfort of me, now we've been co-trustees for a while, and now there's a greater comfort for me to say, Paul, I want you to take everything over. I don't think I want I want anything, but it's, it's something that's smoother was what we're finding with clients than having just it taken away all of a sudden. Yeah, well, one of the bigger reasons that we talk about a revocable living trust is actually the protections after somebody dies. So, um, and, and we'll get into this in, in a lot more detail um, it, uh, later on, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but when someone passes away, there is a shield that goes over the assets as it's handed to the next generation. And it protects against the receivers. So now we're talking about the beneficiaries, okay? The beneficiary, if they had creditors, the creditor can't just come and simply take the money. If they were in the middle of a divorce or had a future divorce, a walking away spouse cannot take the inheritance. So I have two daughters. They're 22 and 23, which makes me just one big sucker. 
Okay, so they're both girls. Now, how much would you believe that if I were to die, left something to my girls, how happy would I be if one of my girls got married and that marriage didn't work and that son-in-law was able to walk away with something that I wanted for my girls? Not yep. very happy. Not happy at all. Okay, so that's called bloodline protection, right? So, so we're protecting the intent of keeping things to the family. And so medical expenses, so creditors, divorces, medical expenses of the beneficiaries, special needs trusts. Um, and in addition, um, uh, for someone who loses a spouse, it ensures that their intent is fully realized as well. So if I lost my wife, um, men get remarried very quickly when they lose a spouse. Don't know if you know that, but statistically, how, how fast do you think a man gets remarried? Statistically. Six months. Wow, okay. <laughs> Two weeks. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of good views of men around here. Okay. Uh, so it's two years, everybody. Okay, so but within two years. But so if I lost my spouse and I get remarried, is that a danger to my wife's intent of where she wanted her estate to go? And the answer is absolutely. So, so, um, so that's what this remarriage of a surviving spouse protects, okay? The pre-trust mindset of a client, somebody who walks into our firm is, well, I don't want to use a trust because I don't want to pull strings from the grave. There are a few of my clients that do, but for the most part, most of my clients do not. Um, my kids are old enough and independent, right? It's their job to take care of the grandkids. It's not my job. And I just don't care what they do with the money. It's theirs. So these are some of the pre-trust mindsets that oftentimes as attorneys we we help clients get beyond these these thought processes then we'll ask at what point is it okay that a spouse who is walking away from your child take what you have left to your child and we just established my point of view of that which is Absolutely never. When is it okay for Medicaid or other government agencies to start taking what you've left? Again, most clients say never. Um, if, you, if your beneficiaries were in a car accident or some kind of cre or creditor was trying to get after it, the, what you've left them, is it okay for them to take it? Most clients, again, say never. And how many of us really in our true heart of hearts would say, I've worked my entire lifetime and it's okay if my kids waste whatever I have earned within 12 months or less because that's statistically true. And by the way, that's statistically true almost regardless of how much someone inherits, which is mind bowling. Um, we have stories, it wasn't in my firm, it was in another uh, firm that we associate with uh, $1.5 million in 18 months, gone with nothing to show for. So it doesn't matter the size, okay? So, um, so when, when is that okay as well? Now, the beneficiaries also have a mindset coming in and when they hear the word trust, if they've never been associated with uh, the discussion as a family or what the parents have done, and we've had this, someone dies and, and the beneficiaries walk into my office and they are already hands on the guns, ready to go, well, what in the heck is this trust thing? Okay, so let's break down some of these mindsets. Yeah, so how much do I get when, do, when and when do I get it? I'm entitled to this um, and can I get rid of this trust thing? They're controlling me or... Mom and dad did what to me is really what, yeah. <laughs> what all of this comes down to. Um, and again, it's getting back to the average inheritance is spent in less than 12 months. And, and, and these are some of the mindsets that we find in the general public 
And these are the things that, that we want to bridge the gap in with a session like this and with families. Um, and actually, this is a good point to maybe bring in your voice for a half a moment. Your experience at the beginning was a little bit different than what we typically see, actually, which is you were very involved yes. with the decision-making process um, with mom. And so how do you think that you being involved, um, even out of the gate, was an advantage or a disadvantage to you? I think it was a huge advantage. I basically knew what my mom's intentions were. I have a brother and it was 50-50, but I didn't understand all the details of the trust and how it operated. And I actually came with her to meetings with Paul and learned all of this, which just made it so much smoother. And I've never had that sensation that it's too controlling or why did she do this? I really recognize it's that it's protective. Um, and you'll probably get into it. It'll also help tax-wise. Yeah, yeah, we'll so get into both the protections and the taxes and everything else and how to utilize this. Right. And so, um, and so that's typically my experience as the attorney. Now we're going to talk about control because that is the big deal about trusts, is that almost everything about a trust and all the misunderstanding of trusts revolve around this one issue, which is, in my humble opinion, God has created us to be people in control. And when control is taken from us, we have a natural reaction. So therefore, let's talk about control for a moment, and that's what the two-way street is. Now, in law, <clears throat> Danielle, now you're my beneficiary. We're going to reverse this, okay? Um, so now, this is my asset, okay? And if I do a traditional plan, a will, a beneficiary designation, and I ignore the trust, and I'd say, okay, Danielle, this is now yours because I love you, okay? Aww, You're so welcome. There you go, there is your inheritance. Now, what are some of the control issues that we have now? Well, I can do anything I want with this now. It's fully mine, but again, if, if I have a walking, if I got married and then got a divorce, now half of this could be taken or all of it could be taken. Uh, if I got into a car accident, then um, whoever's suing me could take this, or I could just unwrap this, eat it, and I have nothing to show for it. Now, and the reason that all of those things exist is because it's in her hand. She has absolute, complete control, okay? Uh, in law, we call that fee simple. It is simply hers. That's all. Now. So that, in the two-way street, and if you're watching online, we've uploaded this so you can see exactly what we're talking about. Um, we should actually put it in, the, in there too. Okay, uh, that, that is the far left, which is, that's called outright. So the access and control is given all to the beneficiary. There's no protections, okay, and that means whatever happens in Danielle's life, I hope it's good, but I don't like just to hope. Okay? So therefore, what she's received is now fully accessible based upon however she decides and also if something bad happens in her life, which we hope doesn't happen. Okay? How this is really going to work then is that our candy bowl, okay? is a trust. So instead of giving her the candy in her hand, instead we take the trust itself and we hand it to her. So now we have a different scenario. Now we have moved one step on our sheet away from her having absolute perfect control of the assets, but now we start to give some of our protections. Okay, so how does this work? It's 
So a bubble of protection goes around what Paul has left me um, because he created this trust. And so that's the reason that the bubble goes around it. And now if I experience that creditor, so if I get into a car accident, someone's trying to sue me and take this, now the creditors bounce off of that shield of protection. Um, so so why, is, why is it that this, we call this bubble the strongest known shield in law. In my humble opinion, there is nothing that can match what this bubble does for a beneficiary. But why is that true? So Paul created this trust. He created the rules that go around it. So in the eyes of the law, because he, is, because he created the instructions, it's actually still his, even though he's passed away. So I took it with me. It with How's me? that? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but now because it's his, so if I stop paying my credit card bill and my parents live over in Eastern Washington and they, my credit card company goes to Eastern Washington and knocks on their door and says, Danielle stop paying her credit card bill, what are my parents going to say to the credit card company? Tough. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. 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 That's it. It's, <laughs> not our debt, right? So Paul did not cause the car accident. I did. So what he's left me, which is still attributed to him, now a creditor cannot come in and take what he's left me. So in here, what we have then are several different um, ways to leave money. Number one, we could just leave it outright, which is the in the hands. We could then create different types of trust, which is um, we could give it at stages, ages, or phases. So in other words, every five years, just give them a third of the trust. Well, the problem is what, what happens when I just simply give it? Goes right back to the hand again. Okay? So every three years, I get three. And then the creditors or, or other individuals may have opportunity to take. Now, we're going to skip lifetime trust. We could use a discretionary. Now, this is when someone needs assistance at all times. Okay? So if we had a special needs child, if we have minors, if we just have somebody who can't manage money and loses every penny given to them, they have no financial skills, someone else may need to watch over them. Okay? And then where we end up for a high majority of all individuals are lifetime protected trusts. This lines up almost perfectly with the two-way street, which is the access and control is given to the beneficiary by a lump sum, which means Corvette University or Las Vegas, here we come, okay? okay. That's a lump sum. <laughs> Versus a special needs or what we call discretionary trust is no say whatsoever to the beneficiary and that is the most protected trust you can have, okay? So, um, so it actually falls in line with the different levels, is, is the two-way street. Now, there's two types of uh, trusts that we can develop. So the first one is a demand trust. That means that a beneficiary, so if Paul gave me his trust, I can go and I can demand that they give me all or some of the money that's in there. So it's in a trust still. It's in a trust still. But I can I can say I want that much and I don't have to ask, I don't have to ask anyone I can just take it. So the problem with that type of a trust in our view is that a court, because she can demand it. So here's the thing about a creditor. I don't care if it's a car accident, um, as much as bankruptcy, a divorce, or anything in between. We have what's a terminology called being in the shoes. Of another okay so in other words if she has the right then a creditor can get into her shoes and they have the same rights that she has so if a, so if she can demand something come out what can a creditor pop potentially do they can demand okay now is that protective not really. And so, therefore, 
demand trust give a lot of power. So that, that is one step over, okay, where it can, somebody can demand. There is a possibility that there's protections, but I already told you how I feel about hopes and possibilities, right? <laughs> so now the next step is a... Is an ask trust. So that means that instead of demanding, give me this much money out of, out of Paul's trust, I have to go somewhere and ask someone, can I take this, this much money out of Paul's trust? And that person would say yes or no. So there's three different type levels of ask trust. Well, we're going to start at the bottom. The first is discretionary, which is the beneficiary has no say whatsoever. Someone else is given all authority. Again, minor, special needs, or somebody who is just completely unable to manage uh, financial uh, issues. The next is called conservative. So conservative trust means that um, if I'm trying to get money out of Paul's trust, Paul says you can only get money out of here uh, if you have a reasonable and genuine need. So um, if I needed it to pay rent, if I needed it to um, uh, have internet access, things like that, I could get it out of there. I need a new car, maybe not. Yeah, it depends. Um, and so need, so in other words, she can't have everything she wants, but will ensure that she, everything that she needs is taken care of. The idea behind that specifically for younger beneficiaries is that the money will last a longer period of time. So my girl's 22, 23. Do I want my girls to spend all, everything that I give them within a five year period so that they are on their own after, at the age of 28 if something were to happen to me today? No, I really don't, right? Because I'm a protective father. I would love to create something that allows them to use what I give them for a longer period of time. Okay, So that's a conservative model. Now the liberal model is wants. Okay? So it, this is really straightforward. The legal language inside the trust is far more complicated, but for educational purposes, this is really how simplistic it is. This is what you need in the conservative. The liberal is, well, what do you want? Now, um, my daughter, one of my daughters is graduating uh, from college uh, it, it next term. So, yay, that's awesome. And she wants a trip to Italy. Well, I already told you I'm a sucker. So, um, so <laughs> guess where we're going when she graduates? Now, if I were to die and I left her only a want trust, how many trips to Italy can she take? As many as she wants. As she wants. And therein lies the difference. Okay, now, this two-way street, which is the two-way street is how much control does the beneficiary have? If the more control they have, then the lesser protections are potentially available by law. Because if they want versus if they need versus if they don't have a say at all. Versus up here, um, we could have put the ask trust. Uh, we, so call the convenience trust, but we rarely use those. So, any questions on the want, the need, the no say whatsoever type of discussion at a high level? May I comment, Paul? Please. In my experience, too, this helps when the want and the need line is a bit gray for the beneficiaries. Um, in my case, it wasn't gray, but about two years after my mother died, um, I was hit by a car and it totaled my car, so I needed a new car, and I wanted to use some of the money. I knew, as co-trustee, he was not going to let me get a Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> I was not in that mindset. I got a Kia. But I've known a lot of people who would, in that situation, go out and get some flash car because they need it. 
So that distinction between need and want, I think, can be different from generation to generation, person to person, and that's part of the concept of passing on those morals and values and your legacy. I think that helps really protect that. And, and also, I'll go back to another statement that we've already made, which is you were more involved with mom's planning mm -hmm. and you understood her values of money, therefore you could honor her with what she's left you by aligning your needs and wants within that spectrum as well, yeah. right? So, yeah, check. I'm just kind of curious since you emphasized um, a lot of people go through their inheritance no matter how much, hearing more about her story, whatever she's willing to share, you know, it's like how long has, has this whole process been for you, you know, and it's not all been blown through, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear that, you know, because I was like, oh, awesome, you know, because <laughs> ultimately I want a success story when my kids aren't having it blown through. <laughs> Yeah, and um, <laughs> so um, every estate is unique. Some some estates are very primed and very ready. Um, uh, part of part part of the story with closing her mom's estate is that we did the planning and then she became unexpectedly ill and we lost her very quickly before we really had the opportunity to get the plan fully done. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, unfortunately for, for what we experienced, we lost some of that time gap to really get the completed version all the way finished. And so, unfortunately, her experience was it took us a little bit longer of a journey. Um, now, that's not to say that in the grieving process, somebody really wants to see me all that often to get it done very quickly. The only time I really find that that's true are single children, okay, um, if, if they have it, or beneficiaries that have financial difficulties. Then I'm fighting them to slow down the process. Um, Debbie, if, if you look back in the first couple of years after you lost your mom, now in hindsight and, and we're at a different place in life, if you were to look back, and you had to evaluate your decision-making process for that. The, I don't know, go, do, it in, do it in chunks. The first six months, the first year, the first two years, compared to where you are today, what, what was that like for you as an individual to walk through that process? So how was your decision-making process right out of the gate? Oh, it was lousy. <laughs> when you're in that grief state, sometimes things just aren't, clear. At least it was that way for me. And I remember, you probably remember the details. We did have a hiccup with one account. It was an IRA. <laughs> <laughs> and this was something that um, my mom was very concerned about the week before she passed. She said, I had to find this paper on her desk and get it signed and send it in. So my brother and I scrambled and got this done. Well, it was the wrong thing to do because of the way the trust was set up. And that was the moment when I realized, you know, you've just got to run everything through Paul and the firm because they know all the ins and outs. They're very detail-oriented. Luckily, he was able to recover that little hiccup and sort things out. But from then on, I knew that really relying on the firm was going to be critical to everything going smoothly. And it did. Um, I don't remember actually how long it took before I had full access because it wasn't fully funded yet. But I know as time went on and everything came to fruition as my mother saw it, it has been very smooth sailing. And it's there. I know her ethics and what she wants done with it. And like Paul said, I honor that. So that's definitely a success story in my view. Now, uh, th th this is not the settlement training. That was last month. But, mm -hmm. uh, but please understand timing. You asked about timing. As the attorney, I'm always trying to pull things to slow down because we're not making the best decisions after we lose somebody that we genuinely love. That's actually some of the greatest areas of where people make financial mistakes is in those first six to 12 months. And so, um, so depending on how we set this up, 
we have a lot of control or we have um, less control. And that is unique to how the creator believes and views their values, their children, and how ready their children really are. So we have a revocable living trust, so that's our candy bowl. I've created it, um, but now I've passed away. If I were married, it actually splits, so half of it goes to a family trust, half of it uh, stays with my husband, um, and they actually get a, there's a bubble of protection that goes around half of, for a married couple, for the survivor as well. So the way that benefits, so then after both of them have, after both spouses have passed away, now it goes down into trust shares for their beneficiaries. So the way that a surviving spouse also takes their half of the community property is the same way that a beneficiary takes it as well so that we can have those bubbles of protection. So I want you to hear, uh, th th this is maybe one of the most important things about understanding a trust. If I, if I die, or if my wife dies, we have created a plan that limits each other's access to our own estate because we want to ensure that it is protected for the other individual. Now, I really want that to sink in for a half a moment because beneficiaries, if you feel that a trust is control, then why would I be willing to give up part of that control even to myself? So in other words, my girls will create, will inherit something that I myself am subject to. Okay? So if my wife dies, that's me. I'm still living. Half of my assets are under my full and absolute control. I can buy my Lamborghini with my own money. I cannot buy a Lamborghini with my wife's money because I have willingly allowed myself to, to have limits to ensure that I am protected with half of my estate moving that time forward. Now those fall into how the girls receive it. Now, my girls are younger, so we have more restrictions as they grow up and as they get older, right, and learn how to manage money better, and, and those are not existent. But this is called a liberal trust share for me as a surviving spouse. It's as much access as my wife can give me without losing tax advantages and protection advantages. Okay? so. If I was to give my kids a full liberal trust, again, I want you to hear the power of this. They are inheriting exactly the same thing as I am willing to run my own life under. So now, I hope that that breaks down some of the myth of there are controls and strings in a trust. Okay, so the surviving spouse runs under the same type of scheme as the children do when it falls down to them. All right. Um, so. So, um, in order to make sure that this bubble of protection stays in place, so there's a trustee. That's the person who is looking down and making sure that the rules are followed in the trust. So they're watching over the trust, and then there is a beneficiary, and that's the person who gets all of the benefit, or all of the money, from the trust. They have two different roles. Washington State says that if this person, the trustee and the beneficiary are the same person, so the same person who's looking down and making sure that the rules are being followed, and the person who can get the money are the same person, then this trust doesn't exist. Now, the reason is, is because um, every trust, the IRS tells us what rules to put in the trust. A beneficiary can use their bucket or their subtrust for health, 
education and maintenance. Now, maintenance is the lifestyle that you're accustomed to living or what you could have lived if you were not as frugal. And that's where we define either liberal or needs or fully discretionary. Okay? So, the, so these are what I can pull the money out of. All right? There it is. So in order to, in other words, these are the rules that I have to follow if my wife were to die and leave me a trust. If I don't have those rules, or excuse me, if I am the only trustee and I'm the only beneficiary, then the law says, well, who's making sure that you're following these rules? And the answer is nobody. So therefore, the trust doesn't exist by law, okay? So now we have to set up a different system, which is what Danielle has on the board. So we have, we add, it's called a distribution co-trustee. Um, and that person is either a CPA, an attorney, or a professional trustee. And the only job that this person has is to look at those distribution rules. So is it for health, <laughs> is it for education, or is it for maintenance, whether that be liberal or conservative, like we just talked about, and um, is the beneficiary asking it, asking for the money for one of those things? That's their only job. And if the answer is yes, yep. then what can we do? Then the beneficiary can pull the money out and they can spend it on whatever they've designated to spend it on. Yep. Um, and then, and ju just before we move on, who, who, who are these players? Who, who gets to choose this person? Yeah, so the trustee, which is, um, so it's the trustee is, who is the same person as the beneficiary. So the beneficiary. So these two and, people are the same. Yep. And they get to choose at the time that this trust is formed who they know, like, and trust. So they get to choose who their distribution co-trustee is. And if they don't like that person later on, then they have the ability to even fire that person and find a new one. So there's a lot of control that the beneficiary actually has of who to work with because um, we want them to work with somebody that they have a good working relationship with. So then let's give, uh, j just, just for clear understanding, because I, I want to be really plain, because uh, you already let the cat out of the bag, so therefore. <laughs> uh, now, you are this person. You're, you are a trustee and a beneficiary simultaneously of the inherited trust you have. Mm -hmm. Who is your distribution co-trustee? I am. Paul Grant. Okay, so who, and that's because I'm an attorney. So who chose to work with me? I did. Okay, so the document did not restrict you to work with me, correct? Correct. Now, if you don't like me next week, are you stuck with me? No. Absolutely not. Because you, as an inheritor, get to choose the person that you want to work with. But it has to be within a category that is on this board. The reason is, is because that's called an independent trustee. And again, the IRS tells us exactly what to do in order to uphold the tax and the, and the protective nature of the trust. Okay? So an independent trustee has to fulfill this role. They only, so then, in a given year, you use the car for an example. The beneficiary, you, came to the distribution code trustee, me, says, I was in a car accident. I need to access some of my trust money to purchase a vehicle. Then my only job was to say, is that health? Nope, not health. Is it education? Nope. So now we're down to maintenance. So now my job was to look at the trust that mom made and determine what, whether it's liberal, whether it's conservative, or whether it's only within my power and discretion, and when I determined, yes, we can actually approve that, then she has the ability to then take the money out. So my only job was to look at the trust and affirm that we're following the rules of mom. And then the law says, well, if you do that, this bubble stays intact. And, and therefore, um, uh, uh, this money remains protected as her mom saw fit to pass generationally through the family, okay? 
So I just wanted to give an example of what that means and what the relationship looks like. Yeah. And so, um, question on that. Now, if we, as the you know creators of our trust, uh, passed away or didn't pass away, but became incapacitated, um, then whoever we designated to make our decisions would they be then put in into that T scenario as the trustee, or how does that work? Yeah. That, 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 that's really not for today's discussion. Okay. This is really aimed at the beneficiaries receiving, not how do we manage it during incapacitation. That's next year's program. Okay, and is that <laughs> next year's program also, oh, wow. like <laughs> if me as the cater have passed on, but because my son is incapacitated, then uh, who is designated to help make decisions for him, would they step into that? role here or how does that work and are you discuss that next year too yeah uh th that's actually not even in in either of those programs you, okay. you have a unique situation um but it, so your son has does not participate in that. Okay. and so someone so he is a discretionary only mm -hmm. someone else makes every decision for him okay. so none of this applies okay so i got off track because we have a second trustee up here Yes, and so there are other things that a trustee has to do besides distribute, so get the money out. And um, so the, the trustee, who is the same person as the beneficiary, they have all investment decisions. They can make any investment decisions they want. They can pull it all out uh, and put it into cash. Um, one of the common questions we get is, what if we want to buy a house? That's actually an investment decision. So the beneficiary doesn't have to ask anybody else to buy a house with the money that's in here. So again, I want to give wings to all of this so we understand and you can see how the relationship works. Have I ever asked you or told you how to invest your inheritance? No. No. I need, I need to see it on an annual basis when we meet once a year, because we only meet once a year, um, to understand the value of how things are moving, but have I ever examined how it's invested? because it's solely your decision. Yeah. So I have no role to play in that whatsoever, okay? So that's this trustee, the beneficiary's sole and absolute discretion of how to invest. And then the, um, the beneficiary trustee also does all the administrative work. So that's making sure the taxes are filed, proper notices are given, keeping records, paying bills. Um, that is solely within the beneficiary's discretion as well. And this isn't anything that scary. We're going to take a break. Um, anything that scary, this is what we do every day with our own finances. So to review, the beneficiary now receives the, the finances. They go to the distribution code trustee to say, I need something, okay? And depending on the rules of the trust that, was, that were set up, it, maintenance could be need-based or it could be liberal-based. You can go over there now. Uh, liberal-based. And if indeed the distribution is approved, then technically what happens is we give the authority back to the trustee, who is the beneficiary, to determine administratively of when to take that distribution approval out. Some people need it right away for like a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we may have set out, I want to take a vacation in six months. Well, as the attorney, I never want you to take money out of this protected entity until you're going to use it, okay? So then, <clears throat> when you're ready to take the vacation, administratively, you have the approval, now take it, put it into your personal account, go ahead and use it as you have been approved, okay? So we're looking on an annual basis of what spending authority do you have in your trust, all right? This is intended to be very flexible for beneficiaries. It's not intended to exert control. Remember, if my wife died, this is exactly how I would run my own personal money, which would then be hers because of community property, half of it split. This is exactly the same way. I would have to find another professional 
who would give me distribution authority. Now, spousal trusts are liberal. Okay? So then I could liberally use it, but I could not excessively use it. Make sense? I could buy the Lamborghini. I could buy the Lamborghini, but with my money, not with my wife's, because look, if I got remarried, if I never used her money, where, where does my wife want her portion of the money to go? Not to, get it to, your kids. to the kids, right? Not to a new wife, that is for darn sure. <laughs> and she doesn't want me to use it on a Lamborghini because she wants to preserve it for the family needs over time. That's her desire. We've talked about this. And as a matter of fact, I think most spouses would say, yes, that's an accurate statement. So therefore, it's a preservation technique, and I'm operating under the same rules as what my girls will operate under. So the trust share runs like a business, so it can't run under um, the deceased person so was Paul's, and I, got, I received um, a trust share from Paul. I can't run it under his Social Security number anymore. So the trust gets its own tax ID number, and it runs just like a business. So making sure that the records and things like that are all kept. And we, Danielle mentioned uh, the beneficiary wants to buy a house. The reason we put this up is because it's the most common example that parents have. Well, what if my child wants to purchase a home? Or what if they want to pay off the remaining portion of their loan Okay, after I passed away? Well, here's one brief tool that, as the attorney, that I would want to see happen. Now remember, this is all theory. I'm going to give you preferences of how to protect your inheritance as it was designed. Number one, Danielle mentioned that that is an investment decision. Okay, uh, right now, what's property in the Pacific Northwest doing? Is it going up or is it going down? Uh, almost weekly it goes up, it seems like, right? Houses are getting more and more unaffordable. Mm -hmm. Is it a reasonable investment, actually, to, if, we, if somebody could, to purchase another home? Sure. Mm -hmm. If I paid off my mortgage, would I anticipate that that money, number one, I save the, 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 I immediately get a return on investment because I'm not paying the bank interest, so I immediately get that. And then I would also anticipate that it would continue to appreciate, correct? Mm -hmm. So that sounds very familiar to me, which is called wise investing. But how does that work? Let's say that I had a $500,000 home and I had a $200,000 mortgage and my parents died. And I'm looking, I'm going, it would be really nice to not have that monthly payment. I would keep all my uh, uh, interest, that's what I wanted, and appreciation. So what it means is that, number one, do I have to involve this person at all in this no. decision no because it's not a distribution to me I'm not asking for the money in my hand rather the trust then what I would suggest so number one could, could you ask for two hundred thousand dollars in your hand beneficiary you can ask okay so um, it's fine you can ask um, depending, depending on your lifestyle and what maintenance means to you, it might even be approved. Okay, but if we do that, we lose the protection. So what if the trust paid off the loan and now we retitled the home to be two-fifths in the name of the trust and three-fifths in the name of my joint property with my wife? Now my wife gets sick and tired of listening to my voice like you are, and she goes, I want out of here. I'm, 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 I'm ditching Paul. How much of our house could she claim in the divorce proceeds? Three yeah, j j j just, just the portion that was still community property. How about the portion that the trust owns? No, zero. no, it comes back to the trust when the house sales, 
And now we just created a protected environment again. Okay? So, instead of actually distributing the cash to the hand of the beneficiary to pay off the, the mortgage, again, we could ask that. As the attorney, I'm always going to try to readjust the thinking process. We can accomplish the same goal, which is I want to save the money. I don't want to keep paying the bank. I agree with all those things. Mm -hmm. But we can just redo re the transaction and the trust can actually now be the owner instead of the other. Right? We have internal risks, meaning the beneficiary. So uh, it, this addresses the lack of financial discipline that we may have talked about. So uh, this is us getting to know the kids and the beneficiaries as we're going through the process. Um, getting to know their lack of financial experience, lack of tax experience. So if beneficiaries are younger, they might just not have had life experience. Um, and then getting rid of the preconceived ideas, that's what we're doing here, is making sure that they're a part of the conversation. Um, and then... So, so, so a couple ways is that um, to counterbalance these issues, some trust makers may go, I can't really trust my beneficiary because they don't have the financial experience, they're too young, or I just know that they're not going to be wise investors. So we can counterbalance that by giving incentives. So if you make so much money, the trust will match that, as an example. Okay? Uh, if you save so much money personally, the trust will match that. Uh, Trusts are reserved for our grandkids, and just income is given to the children. So in other words, it's intended to be generational. Or monthly distributions. Uh, uh, you can have $1,000 a month. Right? Um, or uh, lifetime finances, that is the, I want to make sure this lasts for your lifetime, so it's almost going to act like an annuity. So these are actually, this word, control mechanisms. We need to balance these issues of a beneficiary. Yeah. Um, I have a question with your whole house uh, example you just did. Is it a possibility instead of the trust paying off the mortgage that they kind of refinance that mortgage into the trust and then continue to pay payments yes you know to yes to yeah so so the trust can become the bank yep um, so so the so the controls then are sometimes necessary pending who is, um, who the money is coming to. So that's an incentive. Uh, liberal trust is what we've been talking a lot about. Yeah, so it encourages um, uh, getting budgeting advice, getting investment advice, getting a financial plan, getting tax advice. So, so it's encouraging beneficiaries to get help where they need to. Um, and we can actually ask that they do that uh, as a long-term planning goal. Yeah, so getting appropriate assistance then, the customized trusteeship, that, that's what this is doing, that green sheet of paper, that's a customized trusteeship. Uh, administrative assistance, investment assistance, distribution protection and tax assistance. So now, understand that, for example, if a beneficiary did not want or had or recognized in themselves I've never invested money before. I have no idea what to do. Do they have to keep that function as a trustee? Couldn't they pass it to you? They could pass it off to somebody else. Now, fees are going to go up and other things if there's more responsibility, there's more liability to that trustee, but that's the balance. They don't have to. We can help them in any way that they want, okay? But the whole ideology is as much power, the starting point is for most trusts, as much power to the beneficiary as possible. Tax assistance. 
Uh, so we want to make sure that there's income maximization, but also there's a state tax protection. So that means that um, right now at $2.2 million, that's the Washington State estate tax. One person can pass away with $2.2 million before there's an estate tax imposed. If we just used a will, so just put the candy into my hands, now this is counted into my estate. So if I have $2.2 million by myself and then my parents give me another million dollars, I'm over that $2.2 million. If they... So then, when you die, because you received your inheritance in your hands, first your parents may have to pay an estate tax, then they pass another estate tax to you. That's not good. So if my parents handed me a trust, now what's in my hands, so what's in my personal estate, this does not get added to it. So we keep it separate. So even if they had to pay an estate tax, so if they had over uh, the state estate tax level at the time that they passed away, this is never exposed to estate tax again. It's never counted again. And then I have to do my own estate planning to make sure that we, I save my own estate taxes. But this is never exposed again, and it can grow exponentially. And, and let's review why. So whose money is this? Mom and dad. Mom and dad's, it's not under her social security number. Therefore, when she dies, it's not attributable to her estate. Mom and dad didn't die again. The taxes have been paid. So now let's use this example. This represents exactly what is the maximum in Washington, $2.2 million right now. Okay. Now she lives for another 30 years past mom and dad. She doesn't use this money because she has money of her own in my storyline. This now grows in 30 years. It's minimally tripled and it's probably five times that much. There, there is a high probability that there's eight to ten million dollars in this if she's never touched it. That is clearly over 2.2. Would you agree? Yeah. What are the tax ramifications? Zero. Zero, because mom and dad paid the tax at the 2.2 level, this can now grow exponentially, and now she gets the blessing of passing it to whoever she wants, and they can now take over, and when, and when she hands it off to the next person, is there a tax in that transfer? No, no. This is a phenomenal tax structure. And then the person she passes it to can pass it to the next person. Right. So in Washington State, we can develop a trust for 150 years. Then it must be liquidated under Washington law. <laughs> so That's four generations almost. 150 years, that 2.2 million can be hundreds Astounding. of Astounding. Astounding. So let, let's talk about taxes. There's, there's always two different taxes that we're talking about. Number one, we just talked about estate tax. Okay? This can grow exponentially. Both Washington and the federal government, the federal government tax right now, since Trump enacted his tax bill is at $11.2 million per person, Washington 2.2. Okay? But the federal will always be a swinging pendulum. I don't know if it's the next election cycle or the one after that, but the Democrats will be elected back to the White House. And when that happens, what will they do with the Trump tax? They'll kill it. It doesn't even matter. It, even if it's good, bad, or indifferent, it doesn't matter. It was just that a Republican president did it, so a Democrat president is going to undo it. Okay, that's just the... the Dumb game of politics. Therefore, that will move. It doesn't matter if the federal government lowers their estate tax. That's not exposed. That's a state. Now, we have income tax. We always have income tax. Someone must always pay income tax on an annual basis. Every year. Okay? 
Please answer this one correctly. Do you file a tax return for the trust, which then gets attributable to your personal tax return? Say yes. yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> okay, so. Why? Because that's a different entity. That's a business. So I own the law firm. My law firm has to file a tax return, correct? Because it's a business. And then, after expenses and everything else, the law firm says, Paul made so much money, it comes over to Paul's 1040. Same thing. The trust has to be paid on an annual basis, the income tax. That's an annual, but who does that in the scheme of the green sheet? The trustee. The trustee. And which trustee? The beneficiary, the beneficiary trustee. Okay, so that's the administrative duty. Right? So someone always has to pay income tax. So the income would be in the business, in the trust. Yep. Is it things like uh, distributions on mutual funds or that's exactly uh, correct. dividends and uh, any kind of, uh, and then individually, if you're the beneficiary taking out money for maintenance or health, yep. you would pay individual income tax on that. Uh, not, not exactly. So you, you, you were heading right down the, the okay. bowling alley and then right at the last minute you yeah. went to the gutter. Okay, right. so let's go. <laughs> so, um, so, the, um, so everything you said is accurate, which is that uh, uh, interest, royalties. Uh, what if you chose to buy a piece of property and rent that piece of property? Rental income, okay? Uh, I have many business owners. The business is in the trust. So now it gets, now the business is in there and the business makes income. Okay, all of those things have to have a tax return. Now, what happens to the tax return? The beauty about the trust that we create is that it is by far the most flexible tax document in the marketplace. Okay? Um, if this makes $5,000 of income. Someone has to pay the tax on $5,000. I'm not going to get into it a whole lot right now. Trust me when I say that the, if we leave the $5,000 in here, there is a likelihood that it will have a higher tax rate than, than an individual would. Okay? Therefore, do we want the trust to pay the, just with that basic knowledge, do we want the trust to pay the tax or the person to pay the tax? The person. The person to pay the tax. Why? Because they usually will have a lower tax bracket. Not always. Not always. Just usually. Therefore, whatever was increased in there, the trust actually allows you to leave the increase and just pay the tax on the 1040. So in other words, we don't have to take it. So if somebody is a good wage earner and they have sufficient assets of their own, they may say, I'll just pay the tax of the trust. It's no big deal because I want to leave the protected money in the protected entity. Because what happens if you take it out? It's not That's perfect. the day you get in a car accident. So, so leave it in there. Uh, so, or what if I said I don't have the ability to pay that tax, but I, I'm at a lower tax bracket, so I want the tax liability. What can we do then? We can actually make a distribution so that the tax can be paid to the beneficiary. Okay? Now, here's the thing. This trust gets taxed at lower brackets initially, just like a person does. And then with each step, the tax gets higher and higher. Same thing over in the trust. It's just that the, minim it's just that the numbers change faster. It's called compressed. So we can also, on an annual basis, let the trust pay the 10% tax and then shift everything else over to match your bracket. Um, it, it, 
It's a taxing scheme. As soon as we get into taxes, I lose people right out of the gate. Here's what I want you to hear. It is the most flexible document that you can have. And we can play with the taxes to take advantage of low tax brackets in the trust. But when the trust starts to get higher, we'll shift it over to you to keep it at whatever level you are. So we can play with taxes. It's phenomenal and it's awesome. So two taxes, estate tax, pay it, we're done, grow, 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 grow. Another reason why I don't want you to use your inheritance. Look, use it, when, and that's why it's being left to use, to, to use it. But if you don't have to, what money do I want you to use in life? Your own money. Because with this, this is generationally protected, tax protected, and protected from creditors. Okay? But when it comes out, we can play with the income tax necessities to ensure that you have the greatest tax advantage. Yeah, that's what I was going to. Yeah. yeah, so you basically will figure out how to keep the taxes as low as possible. Yeah, we, we, yes, we can. Um, please understand that if you take a distribution, so remember this, this in my storyline, this earned $5,000 of income. If you took $5,000 or more of distributions in that year, the way trust tax law works is that you first take the distributions, I can't do anything. Only when you do not use money from your trust in that year alone can we then play with the taxing scheme like I've just communicated. So if you took money to live off of, to pay a debt, to go on a vacation, to do whatever you wanted to do because that's why you have it, please understand that there's no more tax playing on an income level. It's all coming to you if you exceed the $5,000 that it created, all right? So, better take the out to cover the taxes. And, and, and then we want to ensure that yes, because you took money out, we're, we're gonna talk about taxes every year. Um, what, what, what was your last year's tax bill? We wanna make sure that that's covered if, if people are using it. But in a year, if Debbie came and said, not touching it this year. Okay, well now we have a year where we can actually play with the taxing scheme. Okay? But any year she comes and says, I need to use some money this year, please understand the income tax of the trust immediately follows the first distributions. Okay? So, um, and then yes, we want to ensure that you had enough to cover that tax as well as your personal. Mm -hmm. All right. So, that gets into some tax stuff. It gets a little more technical. Sorry about that. Please understand this one point is really flexible and um, and actually it is not strings. It is a huge blessing to have the ability to utilize this protection wise and tax wise when we use it properly. All Another right. type of tax planning that we do is generation skipping. So if uh, if my parents left me money, but then they also said, I want to leave our grandchildren something, so skip me as their daughter. I want to leave something to our grandchildren for education purposes or something like that. There's actually a tax. The, um, the government says you have to pay a tax if you're going to intentionally skip a generation. So our, our trusts address that so that that tax doesn't need to be paid. Um, all of our trusts do that. And then if someone is leaving more money than that, we actually create a specific kind of special trust. Or the, the other time a generational, uh, a generation skipping tax is invoked, your parents don't leave anything, they leave everything to you because they like you. Mm -hmm. okay, they even exclude your brother, because who wants to leave something to a brother? Exactly. All right, so now you've received your portion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in my storyline, you die. Yep. But you have kids, mm -hmm. so now you didn't use what your parents left you. You still have candy in your bowl, mm -hmm. but now it has to leave her hands and go to the next generation. Technically, the IRS says you skipped a generation because she didn't use everything that was given to her 
from the original party. In most trusts, there is a tax that is enacted at that point. In ours, there is not. Okay? So, generation skipping trusts preserve legacy to generations. All right? So, I know you, you're conservative. You have a couple of kids. Actually, one of your heart's desire is to ensure that that yeah. happens. Yes. And so your trust, without the, the particular GST language, would be taxed when she passes away to her kids, but not in what we've created for. Very good. Um, and then there's also uh, estate tax, or excuse me, um, to the beneficiaries, if they have not done estate planning themselves, there are protections for them as well. Um, there are things within the trust, so if I inherit a trust from my parents, they have put in what happens if I pass away, where this is to go. So if I didn't do my own estate plan, it's not going to go to probate. Um, or there's not a guardianship that's going to start over me if I became incapacitated and I didn't have documents for this. Maybe over your own personal Maybe, stuff. Right. But, but to that, there's already successor trustees. We've protected the trust, hopefully, from ever going to court. Okay? Um, and so a trust actually helps protect a beneficiary who hasn't done their own estate planning, which, by the way, beneficiaries do your own estate planning. Therefore, we have several different protections. We can name a successor trustee. A power of appointment. What's a power of appointment? So if my parents left me a trust again, and if I were leaving it, so they left my brother out, but I'm going to leave it to my brother, then I can make my own estate planning documents and say, but he's not as good a money manager as me, so I want to put in rules and restrictions on him as he's getting the money. So I can say who the money goes to, if my parents say that I can, in my own estate planning documents, and I can say how they get that. So, so, so again, just to make sure we're following this, she's inherited a trust. Now she has kids, or she has a brother. And instead of this money automatically going someplace, oftentimes it is given to a beneficiary to say, I don't want to treat my kids equally. I have three kids and I want to only leave two of them something because the third one is absolutely great or absolutely horrible. I don't know which way the pendulum swings, but they don't have to leave this in a third. Um, there is the ability to only leave it to one, to others, to charities, those types of things. Um, Typically not to spouses. Typically. Now, why is that? Because we're protecting against spouse issues. And then it's your responsibility, beneficiary, to take care of your own household. So that's why you get life insurance and save money with your spouse to build something to protect each other. Some clients do allow that to be left to a spouse if they um, if their child passes away so we can do anything it's just a matter of what has the creator decided that's a power of a point it's the power to appoint what is left over in my trust should i die but if you don't do anything if you don't use that power then the document takes over and typically the standard language is go find the kids and give it to them equally. Okay, so that's the typical language. Or if you don't have kids, go find my siblings. So, all right. Um, so we can integrate your planning. In other words, we could piggyback that as well. Uh, so that means that I would have a will. My parents leave me a trust. And I say, leave everything in the trust because once I die, I can add something. I cannot add my own assets to a trust that was created for me. Let me say that again. I've inherited a trust. I cannot take my assets and put them into my parents' trust and then say, everything is protected. Nope, it does not work that way. As soon as you do that, you've tainted the whole thing. 
everything is now destroyed. But if I die, I could then drop everything into my parents' trust for the benefit of my children. Okay, so I could piggyback other people's planning. Um, so when you know, when the person knows that the financials are on their way, the inheritance is on its way, um, we walk you through the steps of the transfer. So that's well, something that the law firm would help with. Um, and walking through how you receive, so is it liberal, is it conservative, is it discretionary, so all of those things we would walk you through. Um, and then looking at your own planning, making sure that, again, like Paul was saying, we can piggyback into that um, if that is in what's in your best interest and if that's your desire. Um, and then, By the way, my apology, Danielle. Mm -hmm. That's usually for beneficiaries that don't have a lot, that we want to get whatever they do have into it. Otherwise, we want you to create your own estate plan and really direct your own life. So piggybacking is kind of a last resort. It's really not the best resort. Okay. Paul, if, if my parents, I inherited a trust from my parents, they created these rules. Now, um, I, can't, I don't have the authority to go in there and change those rules. And they're not here to sign the document anymore. Inside of here is what's called a trust protector, which means that um, I can have an attorney, so I could say, Paul, come in here, there's some legal and tax changes that needs to be made so that this remains efficient and effective for me. And so I can tell Paul to come in as the trustee, as, as the beneficiary trustee, I can say, Paul or another attorney, come in and make those changes. All right, because we'll, over time, I don't know if it's next year, five years, or whenever, will tax law change? Yeah. Will the laws that create that bubble, that protection, will those laws change? Probably. Yeah. Um, does this, do estate planning laws change? So in other words, we don't want this document that created the trust, because that's what the maintenance program is for, right, clients? Is that we know this intuitively, things just keep going around. So the, so the beauty of a relationship is now we are committed to watching over those changes and with your permission, we keep your estate plan w during your lifetime efficient and effective so that it doesn't drop off during your lifetime. Well, we have to have the same ability when someone dies, okay? And how that is done is it's called the trust protector. An attorney, like Danielle said, can go in, change the tax law to ensure that it remains efficient and effective. Now, what function, who would authorize that? So if you look at your green sheet, what, what, uh, what authorization does that come from? The three main duties are a distribution trustee, investment, and administration. Trustee. So it's the trustee operating as an administrative role. Okay? So, uh, so a trust protector is actually a very powerful tool to ensure that if we really do want this to be held over generations, that there's a way to come back in and keep the trust working efficiently and effectively. What do I need to do? Number one, we need to coordinate with your own planning. Uh, number two, as beneficiaries, encourage the creators to follow the program. In other words, make sure that everything is in their trust that they are keeping engaged with the firm. Uh, and then make sure that we're current with legal changes as well. That's happening currently through the relationship, through the legacy and maintenance program that clients are a part of. So when can a trust end? Paul said it can last for 150 years. If it's, uh, so if that is um, the if desire, there's money if left. there's money left. Yeah. But if the cost becomes prohibitive and um, it just, the cost is too great and it doesn't warrant the protections, then we can also um, take it out of the trust at that point. So if we keep things in there, 150 years. If we're spending it and using it, then it's when the cost becomes prohibitive. And let me say this, that most, it, it, it's subjective. So there's not a fast, hard rule that says this, it's time to end it. Depends on the circumstance and the beneficiary, but typically, when we're falling under $100,000, 
and, and we're edging towards the, probably that on that $50,000 mark. For most people, it's time to let it go and go ahead and make a final distribution. But it depends, right? If we have a very responsible beneficiary, that could be good. What if we have a beneficiary who has no spending capability, or, or only has spending capabilities, <laughs> no <laughs> investment capabilities, or special needs, or um, or they're addicts, unfortunately. I mean, we see the gamut in families, right? We all, we see it. That would be highly inappropriate to distribute $50,000 to an addict. So it always depends, which is the attorney bailout answer for everything. Well, it depends. Four goals. We want you to know who we are and how to contact us, okay? There's business cards on the desk. Um, there, we'll try to throw up some information, addresses, and other things on the website. It's already all there. So if you're watching the training video, it's all on our website. Yep. We also want you to just know that there is a process. Um, so call us. We'll walk you through the process. But just the comfort that there is a process that we will be following um, and having that comfort. So we wanted to give you an idea of, the, um, of what a trust is and some of the issues that we're going to be facing together as we do this thing called a handoff, in other words, wealth reception. And then encourage interest in uh, planning participation. So like Debbie said, she was able to be part of um, those conversations and it really helped that transition. So encouraging those conversations, whether it be with us or maybe around Thanksgiving dinner tables coming up, um, Excellent time. Yeah. Thanksgiving Happy is meant to yeah. talk about incapacitation and dying. Yes. That's really the purpose. <laughs> we want you to know that if something happens, uh, please give us a call. That we would really, it helps us so much to know sooner than later. When if someone is to pass away, the faster you call us, the faster we can give you directions and the better we can save you from pitfalls that a lot of people do right out of the gate. Again, that was a whole training session last month. It's up on the website. So let us know. Um, uh, know where the red book is. Okay? So red book. What, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the red book yeah. that's on my, the shelf in my den. You're correct, yes. Yeah. So, so you need to know it's in the den. Um, one with the white one and the one with the old one. Oh, good. Yeah. And so she's got it all in the same in place. the same closet where the safe is. Okay, very good. <laughs> now, uh, we'll, we'll take that out of the recording. But, um, <laughs> now, the, uh, but the whole point is, does your family know where to even start to find the, the document? So if you're watching as a beneficiary, again, get involved with no, mom and dad wears even the red book. Where do I even find this stuff, okay? And Again, there is a process. Yeah. Just want you to know that there is a process. Yeah. Again, starting the discussions now, um, it's never a good time when we lose somebody to start learning things. So that's yeah. why we want to really encourage getting involved yeah. now. So thank you for being here. Thank you for yes. the time of watching the video. Uh, this is what it is for, is so that you build a greater confidence that you know what's going on. It only assists mm -hmm. when we lose somebody. Is that an accurate yes. statement? Knowledge is valuable. And, mm -hmm. and it is one of the worst things to have somebody who has never met us, who has, has no idea what the estate plan is, walk into our firm after they lose a parent. It is difficult on us and it is difficult on them. So even by having here and watching this video, you are so far ahead than almost anyone else in, in entire society because nobody runs these things, nobody's educating. And so thank you for taking some of the time. Yep, and then in that same vein, successor trustee training, that is the last Saturday of September each year and the video has now been posted from our last session. Uh, but that is what does it mean to close someone's estate and again having that education and those um, processes is Again knowledge is very valuable. So we hope that this has been a very really useful time. Thanks again for watching um, We're going to take any other questions off of the video, but uh, thanks for logging on. Let us know that you watched it. Please email us with any questions or concerns and comments as well. We really do want to know. So thanks again for logging on and watching our session today.